Okay, I'm gonna start, and then if people filter in, that's cool. Um, hi everybody, my name is Zach, big surprise. Um, okay, so first I wanna give you guys kind of like a summary of what's gonna happen right now, and then um, I'll start. Um, this is gonna be a lecture about witchcraft, obviously. Yeah. Yes. And then um, it's gonna last about an hour is my estimation, but we'll see. And then I'll open it up for questions at the end. I want it to be like free for you guys to come and go as much as you need. So um, if you have a question and you know you can't wait for the end, like interrupt me. It's cool. I I'd rather answer the question. Um, let's see what else. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to be talking about is witchcraft as a practice. Um, but first, to understand witchcraft, we have to understand witches. So I'm going to go through and kind of clear up the different kinds of witches that exist. Um, and then context, I'm talking within a Western context throughout this whole conversation. That's partially because of you guys and of me and of time restrictions. Um, so keep that in mind that some of the stuff I'm talking about varies between different places, but I'll try and clarify that a bit. Um, last thing that's like preemptive, um, if anyone, like if I say a word that you don't understand, might happen, um, or use a term that you've never heard before, feel free to just scream out lit check. Thank you, Autumn. Um, and I will define it for you as best as I can. Uh, don't be afraid to interrupt for that, please. It's important that I'm not just talking to myself. Okay. Um, so, let's talk about witches. Um, I'm going to go further into the different kinds of witches in a second. But first, what I want to do to get an idea for all of us of uh, what different ideas you already have about witches and what the word witch means to you, I'm going to ask a couple of you to just define the word witch. Uh, don't be afraid of like messing up or whatever. This is just to get an idea of where you're all at. So, like the way that I understand, so there are like various traditions and like practices that like a witch could follow. But like basically, it's like the um, the use of the Earth's energy to, like, promote change and, like, stop change and move change in other places, and it comes with uh, a few universal rules and, like, law of and things like that, so it's, like, a witch kind of affects nature, but is affected by nature at the same time. Awesome. That was very complicated. There's a lot in there. Um, anyone else want to venture a guess? This can be, like, the Wicked Witch of the West. Like, I just want to hear anything. So, my family sort of raised me as sort of pagan ideology, and my sister really went into that, so she started her own Wicca of that thing. Um, so, as I understand it, it's a lot about celebrating the solstice and celebrating um, our, the human's relationship with the earth and giving back to the earth and just trying to maintain um, a mutual, but mutually beneficial relationship with the earth. Okay. And can I get like two more people to? Just give it a shot. <laughs> Someone? Yeah, go on. It's like really spooky folk who like are super in touch with what's going on around them, you know, the world and the nature and stuff like that. Okay, one more person? Someone who does magic. Very good. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So within that, we don't have a whole bunch of paradoxes, right? Most of those definitions were kind of the same, which is how you know that we're all coming from a pretty similar context here. Um, and a lot of the words and the terms and the ideas that you all brought forth, um, which was awesome, thank you again, um, was ba were based on very new ideas of witches. So that's something I hope you get from the end of this. Um, you know, by the end of just my list, I hope that some of these ideas are challenged and, well, anyway, all right, let's do it. Um, so the word which um, itself is pretty ambiguous here. Most cultures, most traditions have a set of very specific words in their own language to denote different kinds of witches, different kinds of sorcerers, magic users. Um, However, in English, we have a couple, like magician, sorcerer, I just said that, witch, but they are kind of synonymous. So um, 
The word which comes from the old English word vicha or viche, which means male or then female sorcerer. Um, however, the deeper like Germanic roots of that word are still like super debated. Some people think it means to twist or bend. Other people think it means wise. Um, so that kind of shows you that even the origins are pretty ambiguous. Um, okay, so when we're thinking about witches, we have to think about where we're getting this information. Where are these ideas coming from? Um, how are we seeing witches? So can someone like just let I me mean, shout them out, you don't have to raise your hand, just where do you see witches? Where do you get these ideas? Disney Channel. Disney Channel, right? Okay, so let's see. So movies, novels, maybe cinema. Alright, that's why. Someone else? Folk tales. Folk tales, awesome, perfect. So I'm gonna say ballads and folk tales, yeah. Art, like visual art. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Historic events like Salem. Awesome. How do we know about Salem? Um Mostly through I don't know, books, but also in part just when you go to Salem, there's a bunch of tourism stuff. Absolutely. So tourism stuff. Um, and but I'm going to focus on because it's a really good example. That's the most common one. Um, historical documents, especially trial documents. So that's you know that's where we get most of our info. So I'm just going to say legal documentation. Okay. Uh, religious documentation. Perfect. Someone else? Performing arts. Performing arts, awesome. I'm gonna keep that in, in the visual arts, but that's a really good example. Um, you know, theater, like that. That's kind of gonna go all in that. Perfect. Um, I'll give an example. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Family. How do you think? You all control. <laughs> um, the only thing that we didn't say here, um, which is interesting, is uh, spell books or grimoires, which are something we do have access to. So, spell books. And I'll get more into what the fuck a grimoire is in a second, but bear with me on that. Um, awesome. So, from the various figures that emerge within these different resources, um, we will understand what witches are. Um, so in the religious texts, we see a context, right? Um, some examples of religious texts are uh, the Bible, that's one, um, the Quran, etc. Then besides just like these holy texts, we have other works of literature that are based on religious ideas. Uh, the most famous of these would probably be the Malleus Maleficarum, which is translated weirdly as the Hammer of the Witches. Um, and that was a text like teaching religious uh, clergymen, etc., how to, how to prosecute witches, essentially, find them. Um, legal documents. So these are from like witch trials, these are from um, accusations. Um, and you know some other things that just come up in the courtroom. So these are really problematic, right? Because um, in the early modern period or the late medieval period in Europe, there's the resurgence of the old inquisitorial system, uh, which means that you could get tortured to get information out of you. Um, so what happens when someone's tortured? They're going to say whatever they can to get to stop. Exactly. So we can't take. Um, a confession given under torture as fact. However, um, you know, someone being tortured, not thinking very clearly, is going to say whatever first comes to their mind, right? Um, they're going to say that they're a witch, but then the person's going to press them for details. The Inquisitor's going to try and get as much detail out of them as possible. And within those details, we see them mirroring or reflecting all of the ideas of what makes a witch from their society. So the Sabbaths that I'll talk about, et cetera, these are things, images, ideas, fears that come out through these torture methods. 
movies, novels, that's something that's most relatable to us today. Um, okay, you know enough about that. Uh, ballads and folk tales, these reflect like the more popular ideas, where these religious texts are more the like top-down, elite, literate ideas of which is here we see what the people were afraid of, what the people thought of um, when they heard the word witch, or whatever translation is available for that. Visual art, we can see like a transformation and the usage of these ideas, but also like you know, we can see now, but it gives us a lot of accessibility, right? We see how these ideas were challenged and promoted for especially Shakespeare. Shakespeare's got a lot of witches in it. Um, people is interesting because um, I would say that like the most interactions you'll have with people about witchcraft are from a very particular part of witchcraft, um, which is reflected by um, the comments you guys already made. So. A lot of the kind of witchcraft that I'll be talking about today doesn't come out of the nighttime, doesn't come out into the public, doesn't give lectures. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind. Spell books and grimoires, they give us a really good idea of like what these people who practice magic were actually doing, whether they're like recipe books for spells from like some old lady who lives down on that weird road, or they're like really thick, dense academic texts about how to summon demons. We're seeing how people do all of this stuff. Okay. So now I'm going to go into the different kinds of cookies. Anyone have any questions yet? So first, let's talk about legendary witches. So this is, you know, from the. Uh, or did I talk about? No, you know, I missed one source. So um, epics and legends, right? That's another form of literature that we have access to. Um, and so, you know, looking at like the ancient Greek epics, like the Odyssey, um, the Golden Ass, which I think like the, um, we see lots of these figures emerging. Um, examples are Circe, uh, Erichtho, um, Pamphile, Medea, Busla, and these are people who are changing the story in some way, right? Mostly they're villains. Um, you know, like Busla, uh, who's this Icelandic witch, kills, uh, curses this king with this like awesome incantation where she's like, I hope elves and trolls and stallions like, fuck you, and it's great. <laughs> um, and then uh, Medea is like killing her brother and chopping her children to babies and poisoning princesses and just going nuts. Um, she's great. We also have a lot of donors. Um, so donors in these sorts of stories are people who move the plot along. So this is a good example of how these things blend, these roles blend. Uh, she turns all of uh, um, Odysseus's men into swine, right? But then after that's all been fixed and resolved, she gives them the key to the next part of their journey, which comes from her access to like divinity, right? Um, she tells him how to like summon his old friend and from the dead, etc. Um, and then also lovers, right? Cersei's another example where they had a lot of sex on that island. So um, that's just something that pops up a lot. Often legendary witches are not completely human. Um, they stand somewhere between being spirits and working with spirits, um, mostly the latter. But uh, often they're sons of, oh, sorry, they're daughters of gods and goddesses. Oh, another point is that they're usually women. Any questions about that? Awesome. So the next kind uh, is witch doctors or cunning folk. Now this, there's like so many different words you can use to talk about these guys. And they're a character that we see emerging um, from you know, our oldest legal documents to you know, anthropological texts from the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and since then, we've seen like a sh really sharp decline in the amount of people continuing these traditions. Um, so what do they do? They are humans, not divine. Um, their main role in society is like charmers and protectors. They protect against evil spirits, diseases. Um, they also protect against witches. That's confusing, that's good. Um, they 
will heal people. They heal physical ailments, spiritual ailments. Uh, let's see, they're mediums, so they communicate with um, other like, nature spirits. They communicate with uh, God or the dead is a big one. Um, and yeah, they're also diviners, so they can like predict the future, stuff like this. And they're social mediators. So often we'll find texts about these guys like having, um, you know, the guy come to, you know, some guy from the village running over and out of breath and being like, I don't think my wife's cheating on me. And like, will you like do this spell to make it right or whatever? And they're like, yeah, totally for this much money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's an important role for them as well. One thing I want to clarify with witch doctors and cunning folk, however, is that they're not always magical practitioners, right? Some of the time, um, not every person who knew herbal remedies or, um, you know, folk ways of healing people also practice magic on the side. Um, the biggest role, I think, for these guys was that they were an accessible form of healthcare for people, uh, commoners, who did not have access to uh, religious or uh, pharmaceutical means of taking care of themselves. Um, and also of, like, official or theological ways of, like, getting rid of evil spirits, etc. These guys were much more available. Um, all right, so the next one is necromancers. So in ancient Greece, necromancers were people who would summon the dead for the purpose mostly of divination. Um, however, going into the like early 10th to 12th centuries, the, in Europe, the word starts to take on a new meaning. And um, so from like the 10th century onwards, there's this uh, new branch of philosophy that's coming up, especially from like Islamic um, theologians and philosophers. And it's coming into Western Catholic um, philosophers and their writings and ideas. Um, and a lot of this is based on like understanding the world around us. Um, sort of a proto-science, right? But instead of just studying the physical world around us, to them, things like astrology and heaven and hell and cosmology and God and the essence of all of these things was equally important in understanding the natural world because to them, all of these things were just as tangible against this table. So this is really similar to alchemy in that sense, and it's like sort of a, you know, earlier idea of not only understanding but also experimenting with these forces. So um, one thing we start to see happening more and more from here in like the 10th century through the early modern period is these necromancers um, creating really complicated circles on the floor and making really um, specific amulets and working with expensive materials and heavy books and it's all very precise and detail oriented to summon demons predominantly but also fairies and witches which are like, and, um, you know, other kinds of nature spirits to essentially torture them into giving them information about the natural world. So whereas the witch doctors and the cunning folk have this very practical sort of base function, um, this very relatable function, these guys, the necromancers, are working in private spaces mostly, and they're trying to, you know, it's sort of like a more academic, elite form of magic rather than a practical base one. Um, however, there's this misconception that they worked necromancers and like witch doctors would work, or cunning folk, I'll say, worked very separately from each other, that there was no interface, that they exchanged no ideas, but we've <coughs> come to learn more and more that that's not at all the case and that um, like there's a lot of really rich examples of like, you know, the village witch who like comes up to the church in the middle of the night and like fucks the priest and then learns what he knows about demons. You know, it's really, it's, it's interesting. Um, okay, so the next one is perhaps the most complicated. So, any questions so far? Yeah. Um, you mentioned ancient Greece for necromancy and where it kind of started to become its origin. Mm -hmm. Does that put oracles under necromancy as well or no? Mm -hmm. Depending on the oracle, yeah. Um, in terms of summoning the dead to understand future events, faraway events, um, 
past events that are lost in the records. Yeah, um, but for the most part, it was the role in ancient Greece of uh, magicians and witches. Um, witches and magicians were not something accepted in ancient Greece or Rome. I'll talk about that in this next section. But um, for the most part, oracles were connected to divinities rather than the dead. Um, and so, like, the Oracle of Delphi, like the most famous one, she was, you know, which is a role, it wasn't one person. She would be um, working with the muses and the god Apollo, for whom she was, like, uh, she dedicated herself. And that was where she would get her information. Um, I think, is that, okay, cool. So, the next one is sabbatic witches, or apostate witches. Okay, so coming from these same theologies and philosophies that were coming up in this time period, we see the creation of a really particular, really specific character. And basically what this character is, what this early modern witch was, was if you took all of the aspects that created like a good person in that society, everything that made someone a good person, and you flipped it on its head. You took every little aspect and you inverted it. Then you would get a sabbatic witch or an apostate witch. Um, in, and this is something very calculated by theologians and philosophers, again, originating from Islamic theology and then transferring and filtering through Catholic belief. Um, and so it was something very top-down, right? This wasn't something that people already believed in. It was something that they were told to uh, believe and that they readily incorporated, as this usually works. So um, in a highly religious society, which it was all over Europe, um, you see, obviously, that a, an inversion of a good person is someone who's not even like atheist or not religious, but he's taking the very you know, most sacred ideas and ideals and flipping them on their head. So this was happening right after there was a huge uh, effort to wipe out heretics in Europe. Um, so heretics are people who have a slightly different idea of um, God or Jesus or what is deemed orthodox by the church. Um, literally tiny, tiny details, two big, big ideas. These people were you know, flayed, tortured, murdered, burned, um, you name it, pretty much the same as witches. The difference, however, is that while heretics were taking little aspects or big aspects of Christianity and saying, no, I disagree, and being killed for it, this idea of the witch is someone who, took, which isn't like a real person, right? So that's, the heretics are real people. This is an idea projected onto real innocent people. Um, they, instead of differing, were rejecting. God and Jesus and the trilogy and whatever. Um, Trinity, sorry, that was weird. Um, so, obviously, they're worshiping the devil instead of God. And at the beginning of their, at the initiation that we often see described in these legal documents, the witches say that they, um, you know, they meet the devil with other witches at midnight in a cemetery, whatever spooky thing they can come up with. Um, and they, the first thing that they do is like, forsake God and the Trinity and essentially remove their baptism, right? And then get rebaptized by the devil and there comes all of the powers, etc. bestowed upon um, them. So where is so that's what apost apostate is like that. It's the rejection of a belief system completely. Um, whereas heresy is the altering or disagreeing with the belief system. Um, but where is this Ritual happening. Where is this initiation happening? That's the other part of this title, which is sabbatic. So um, you can notice that there's some anti-Semitism tied in with the terminology here, where the witches would fly to the Sabbath to worship the devil. Um, Sabbath obviously comes from the Jewish Sabbath. So, you know, it all flowed together pretty well. Um, so they were... One, one really big aspect of these kinds of witches was that they would fly out during the night, either uh, by anointing themselves with a flying ointment and then floating or leaving their body to attend, or they would ride on brooms or on animals or on demons. Um, uh, methods are abundant. 
Um, and there they would come to this usually you know giant gathering of people. Um, sometimes it was smaller, but often it was like described as thousands and thousands of people, more people than could gather unnoticed in one place, um, you know, like every so often, like more people than were in that area. So we know that this is something projected, right? These aren't, weren't meetings that were actually happening, or these are great, great exaggerations of something small that was happening. And um, here there would be witches who are mostly women, the Sabbat Epipostate, which is are mostly women. About 75% of people killed in the early modern period were women. However, that's a number that gets really over-exaggerated. A lot of people think that um, these witches were just like all women, but really thousands of them were men. Um, and there would be, you know, women eating babies, which is a clear inversion of like the role of the mother during this time period. Um, and they'd be like making magic and mixing potions and um, digging up dead bodies, which is obviously something you don't do. Um, just, you know, doing crazy, creepy things, but all things that are like the epitomes of evil. Um, okay, so these are, if you haven't gathered, like the famous witches of the witch craze, the witch trials in the early modern period. Um, and I just want to clarify really briefly that this was not the first time, this was not the beginning of witch hunts. Um, in fact, the ancient Romans killed more witches than the Catholic Church or Protestant Church combined ever have. So that brings to mind that, like, the word witch is not really sufficient. Um, anyway. Okay. Because clearly there's, like, a conflict of ideas there. No. Mm, am I missing anything? Oh, uh, well, okay. So then this was still, like, happening during the Catholic reign, but then in the early 1500s, Luther happened. And um, the biggest consequence, I think, of that entire um, you know, craziness was the fact that he kind of cut or took the carpet out from underneath a whole bunch of people, thousands and thousands of people, where they had stacked their belief system. And within that belief system, there was a, a structure, an order, with which they could deal with crazy, supernatural, scary things. And then as soon as you take that order from underneath them, there's just panic, right? Everyone's paranoid as fuck. Um, and every little thing becomes like witchcraft, or a werewolf, or a vampire, or a fairy, right? And this is something that is uh, still a big part of our culture. If you haven't noticed the like, finger pointing, it's the devil thing still happening. Um, <laughs> and that's where that comes from, which is weird. Um, so Luther was a shit dick also. <laughs> he, get, he, gets, he gets called really awesome. You know, people talk about Luther in a really good way because he called out the paradoxes within the Catholic regime. Um, but he also would like, you know, order the death of like thousands of Germans just because he said they were the devil. So like, great. Um, okay. And then, you know, these, this figure is clearly a scapegoat, right? So this is a way for people to deal with these fears and the paranoias of a very um, undereducated, very high, a society that's in a high state of change and turmoil. All right. Um, so most of these people, the thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that were killed for being witches were not actually practicing magic or doing anything. Um, actually, very few witch doctors and cunning folk were murder for practicing magic. Because again, this is a top-down idea. These are bottom-up ideas. So when they bring someone into a courtroom and they're like, ah, oh, you're a witch, and they're like, well, I mean, kind of. Like, I do this, and they're like, what? <laughs> That's not what this book says you do. So there's another phase. And then eventually, um, especially with Luther, these popular beliefs um, start to get eradicated more and more because that's something he was very against. Um, mostly fictional people. Right? or fictional characters described to real innocent people. However, belief and culture breed behavior. So then we have potential malefic witches. So for the most part, especially in the early part, we know we can kind of, you can tell when you're reading these trial documents that these people are just like, saying no, 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 until they can't take the pain anymore, and then they spill. Later on, um, and up until today, you start to find more people who come up 
voluntarily and confess to doing all these things without torture, without duress. Um, they like, there's, you know, it's like you've been fed all of these beliefs your whole life, right? And then, um, you know, and, and you're you're scared, and uh, you know, you don't act like people think you should act, and so people are already kind of whispering about you, and then you like pray really hard that your abusive husband dies terribly, right? Um, and then, you know, he gets struck with some terrible disease that no one knows how to cure the next day. And you're like, fuck, I'm a witch. <laughs> so you feel really guilty, and you come forward, and you're like, I think I'm a witch, because this happened, and, um, you know, now that I think of it, this and this, and this paranoia builds on itself, even against oneself. So we start to see potential malefic witches. The most famous of these was Isabel Gowdy. Awesome, if you can get your hands on her trial, it's like, oh, it's like a novel. Um, and she came forward in 1662 in Scotland to be like, yeah, I like run around with fairies and I fight the devil and it's got a giant in it. <laughs> um, and she didn't get killed, right? Because they didn't really, I don't know why she didn't, I no. um, and that's something, you know, that's a character that's very different from the witch doctors and the cunning folk, obviously, um, but is also a tangible person. And um, the rarest of them. We have very few examples of this happening, but it definitely happened. Um, and if you talk to, like, really old people who grew up in the mountains or the countryside, they can usually, like, talk about how their mother or their aunt would like got really pissed at someone one day and went to the witch. So like there, you know, there's these people who were doing bad things. And whether those people were witch doctors or like actual malefic witches, there's only so much we can say. Okay. Um, I'm going through more types. <laughs> Any questions? I don't think the potential, the potential, the, those ones. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, would they be treated differently, like uh, when punished versus like? Uh, people who are just, like, had that image projected on them? That's a good question. It really depends on the time period, and it really depends where they were, and it really depends who was uh, inquiring, right? Who was, who was the inquisitor? Um, usually, they would be guilty. Um, but, you know, we have some cases like this about Gaudi where we don't really know why. Perhaps they were like, well, good on you. Just do this and this, and, you know, get vegetables thrown at you and, and live uh, in isolation your whole life, and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, so next we have the folkloric witches. This one's fast. Um, so these are characters like Baba Yiga in Russia, or... Um, God, someone throw some witches at me. Um, so these are characters in these, you know, ballads and folk tales, like you guys were saying before, um, who are either monsters, again, or lovers, or um, demons, or donors to the story. And, um, yeah, again, they're less human, right? And this is another non-tangible character. Um, let's see. And then phantasmal witches. So most of these have been people working with spirits, right? But there's this huge branch of belief that treats witches, with that word, um, or its direct translations in lots of languages, as uh, fairies or ghosts <coughs> or um, demons or um, vampires. And they're these invisible, like almost, usually they're, it's, like, it's almost described as like a swarm, right? Like an invisible swarm of like spirits that just like fuck up your butter as you're churning or like kill somebody or like <laughs> anywhere in between, right? Um, and so this is interesting. These are, this is the kind of witch that like witch doctors protect against and necromancers summon into their circle. Um, and there's some weird conflation between these guys, but you know, there's, and these guys often have a lot in common um, with you know, rowan berries and things like that, protecting against their evil influences. Um, so it's interesting to think. Um, so here we see belief in witches, belief in fairies, belief um, in vampires and ghosts, all kind of conflating, and we can see this in ritual. 
Um, I did a project last year in Italy where I was interviewing the 84-year-old woman I lived with, and she talked about this little village kind of near where she grew up called Casentino, and there they would leave out bread and wine or water um, on very specific nights for the witches so that the witches would come eat the offering and leave them in peace. It was like a really ancient thing. That's like some ancient Roman shit, right? But this is happening in the early 1900s still. Um, people do the exact, exact same thing for fairies and ghosts on specific nights throughout Europe and actually lots of, many parts of the world. Um, so that's interesting, the idea of a witch being a spirit rather than someone who works with spirits. All right, last one is... Oh, there we go. So we have contemporary witches. Okay. So this gets, I mean, obviously we're all modern and contemporary, we're happening right now. So it, it makes sense that this is most of our definition of the word witch. Um, most of them fall under this category. And they're based on, and they come from various traditions, like you were saying, and various, uh, you know, sort of movements that have happened in the last uh, 100 years or so. So, uh, quick, quick history on that as much as possible. Um, anyone ever heard of Aleister Crowley? It's not, it's nice. uh, he's a creepy motherfucker, but anyway. Um, he wrote uh, huge volumes, and he was very into, like, the occult, um, and this was in late 1800s, don't quote me on that. And he would, um, you know, he was really experimenting and trying to draw out all of these, like, medieval and ancient rituals and traditions, and he was sort of forming new things and creating groups and having orgies and doing all these weird things. And he, but he, his writings influenced a lot of people. Interesting character. Um, and we see, at the same time, a whole bunch of people getting really interested in metaphysics and the occult. Um, Helena Blavatsky, um, Austin Osmond, Austin Osmond Spare, um, etc. So, um, you guys know about like the Illuminati, the Golden Dawn, Knights Templar, stuff like that. This, um, the Rosicrucians, that all sort of formulates in this time period um, with these mystery traditions, uh, which are secretive societies that have occult beliefs and usually practice some sort of ritual or magic or. Um, philosophy of that ilk. And, uh, yeah, so they, one, one of the predominant groups was called the Golden Dawn, and they had a very set ritual structure. All of, they're no longer considered really a mystery tradition, because you can go to Barnes & Noble and check out their book. <laughs> like, you, you know, it's, it's kind of everywhere. Um, so, in 1949, 48, 49, there was a man in Britain named Charles Gardner, and he had this awesome idea to take a whole bunch of Crowley stuff, a whole bunch of the Golden Dawn stuff, and a whole bunch of the ideas and rituals that we've been talking about this whole time. And he forged a religion, which was called Wicca, Vicha, as I talked about at the beginning. It means witch. And so this was a belief based on witchcraft and the ideas of witches. Um, however, the structure of it, the actual tangible essence of it, was more based on these occult traditions of the early to late 19th century. Um, and this became, like, crazy popular. Um, he said he portrayed it as some ancient religion, which he had been initiated into, uh, but there's literally no proof of that. There's actually a lot of counter evidence to that, and that he just kind of made this up. Um, but he did a good job. It's interesting, and it was compelling, and it drew a lot of people in. And it was a huge resurgence in the public eye of witches, which had been sort of <coughs> only in the realm of folklore for a long time. Then it became tangible, right? Um, and so it took off, and he started forming covens. Um, the New Grove Coven was his original one. And then um, some people from his original covens became offshoots and hives, um, and so in L.A., we have Alex, uh, Alexander Sanders, um, who forms his own Wiccan Coven. So we have this British group and this, yeah, you know, L.A.-based American group. Um, and they're like media wars. They're like really trying to get as many films 
made about them as many interviews with them as possible. They're outing witches in their covens who don't want to be outed. These are mystery traditions. And we, again, I'm just going to stress again, Wicca with a capital W is like a mystery tradition. We don't know shit about what Wiccans did except for what they told us. Um, and it was still a secretive thing, which you had to study a year and a day to gain initi initiation into. Um, however, like, they didn't want it to be that secret, so it started coming up in all of these documentaries, and it caught on at the same time as the hippie movement in the early 60s, and the feminist movement moving into the 70s, and the gay rights movement moving into the 80s, and it becomes this huge explosion. And people really don't want to study for a whole year and a day to, like, cast some spells. They're just kind of like, give me a spell book, I'm ready, I'm going to go, I'm a candle, let's do it. Um, and so the popularity of the actual covens themselves of these mystery traditions falls away and now is like barely existent. Um, and we have this new thing called neo wicca which is a term I made up, but people seem to be using it, so that's good. Um, and it is what you want, when you walk into Barnes and Noble and you go to the like new age section and you see all the books with wicca and witchcraft and magic and moon spells and stuff like that, that's exactly what that is. It's kind of a, like, take all of these ideas, put them in a cauldron, boil them down, and pick out, like, three things, and, like, that's what you're going to do. So it's very, like, unorganized, um, based on your, like, feelings and do whatever you want kind of mentality, um, which sometimes is fine, sometimes is appropriate if it's shit, um, which we see with, like, people burning sage and stuff, which is an American Indian tradition that not every American... In okay, I'm going in a candidate. Um, but, anyway, then the new the neo-Wiccan uh, craze turns into um, people kind of trying to distance themselves from it because they're realizing the, like, negative things that have come up with this New Age movement and the secret and thinking that all you have to do to get something is believe in it really hard and tell that to a starving kid in Chicago, right? So people start calling themselves like traditional witches and putting very weird, this is, you know, this is all in the last like 10 years, putting very like intense titles on themselves and very weird niche groups of witches to try and give themselves some authenticity. Um, and that's kind of where we are today. However, today, if you still, like, go to the countryside, go to the mountains, if you're lucky, you might find, like, an actual, like, witch <laughs> based on the really, as I've said, ancient rooted traditions um, that then became what they are today, which is still witch doctors, potential malefic witches, some necromancers, although that's more of, like, an urban thing, right? It's elitist, urban, not based on popular belief. Um, so those are people you'll find in cities. And it's all just kind of blending together, which is uh, interesting and frustrating to watch at the same time. Um, okay, so who, I've kind of gone over this a little bit, and we're wrapping up like literally on time, I'm so proud. Um, actually, before I do this, any questions? Where's the Arthurian idea of witchery, like Morgan Le Fay and right. that stuff? Okay, interesting. So Morgan Le Fay is, I would say, a legendary witch, right? Um, it's hard because Arthurian legend is a huge network of various beliefs that came into Britain, um, and some of them are, like, Sassanian in origin, some of them are British in origin, most of them are Roman in origin, and um, it's kind of hard to weed out the different aspects, and it really depends on the rendition of the Arthurian legend, right? Um, if we're looking at uh, Marion's and Mary Bradley's, uh, the, what was it again? The Mist of Avalon, um, Morgan Le Fay is this very, um, you know, relatable but also mystical character. She has this very intense connection with the other world and with fairies and um, is very powerful and is related to royalty, and all of these things play into the idea of a witch. Um, one thing I didn't talk about so much that I'll bring, because this brings it up, is, um, again, the relationship between fairies, uh, vampires, werewolves, and witches. So, fairies, witches and fairies, whether the witches are working with fairies or with the uh, phantasmal witches, whether they're treated like fairies, there's always, like, a really intrinsic connection here. 
Um, there's a great book, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Noirl. I don't know if anyone's read it. Awesome novel. Really long, but so worth it. And that's like, uh, it's an author, but she did incredible amounts of research, actually, put into that. So if you're, yeah. Um, and I'm not going to get too much into that. But uh, vampires and witches are very related um, in the folkloric beliefs of witches. Um, so you'll have, like, these demonic, seeming, like, monstrous witches who, um, like, in the Philippines, they, like, will stand on a cliffside and the top half of their body will detach itself and float off and spout bat wings, and they'll, like, get a super long tongue and they'll fly to the crib and, like, suck the blood from under a baby's fingernail, you know, so it's, like, these really, like, morbid, blood-sucking, nocturnal things. Um, and this relates to, like, the oldest ideas of the wicked witches that we have, which are these representations of nighttime, winter, and death. So, because to ancient societies, that's evil, and this is like the evil eye um, idea. And so, blood sucking, but especially of babies, this plays in. And then in other ways. Um, and then werewolves are something, the way we think of werewolves now didn't get created until the early, early modern period, until after Luther fucked shit up. Um, and that, I mean, witches have always been thought to, like, transform themselves into other animals, black cats, that's where that comes from, um, also hares, and um, in Mexico, like, turkeys, um, anyway, and one of these things is wolves, this book here, um, that talks a lot about the transformation of witches into other animals, and then how that relates to werewolves, there's some flawed stuff with it, but, um, that's okay. There's a lot of research that wants to be done about werewolves, but... Okay. Good? All right. So, which of these types of witches are people? Real humans that we can interact with and talk to? In other words, who in this list can we study the actual practices of? Right? Legendary witches? No. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. Very much. And, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say also these guys. Whether no matter how we're hearing about them, no matter what the resource is, we get an idea of like what these real people might actually be doing. And again, these are categories I made up based on research. So they're not perfect. There's some people who stand in between them. Um, so I like that one as well. So I've already talked about what these different people did, right? Everyone need any clarification on any of the specific terms? <coughs> yeah. I just wonder, where does the practice of voodoo kind of fall into all of this? That's an awesome question. I'm giving another lecture <laughs> 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 about uh, voodoo and racism and voodoo and um, exactly what you just asked. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. Really briefly, um, voodoo is a religion that came from the Yoruba people in West Africa and was brought over during the slave trade and mixed with Catholicism in Mesoamerica, the Caribbean, and Southern United States. Um, it's a religion with a spiritual practice. Magic is a part of that spiritual practice, but it's not a magical tradition. Um, hoodoo is the magical tradition that comes from the same cultures and some other cultures. It's its own thing. It sounds similar, but it's really different. Um, and so hoodoo is magic. It can even be described as witchcraft in some really loose ways, but it's really this kind of stuff. Um, and the book about that <laughs> is this one here. Zora Neale Hurston, fucking my idol. I love her so much. Um, but she writes this awesome book called Mules and Men, where she actually goes through the South and meets these who uh, root workers, conjurement, who headed doctors. Um, not only meets them and interviews them, and works, she like works with them, she learns, she's initiated by them, um, and she just writes it down, and it's fucking mind blowing. Anyway, okay. it's great. So, really good question. Um, hoodoo tends to lie somewhere between this and the idea that comes from West Africa, where the, the differences between good and evil are not so dichotic. It's sort of like someone can be a two-headed doctor and heal one client or patient in like at three o'clock and then like at five thirty they're cursing someone's lover, right? And that's not 
contradictory. Um, okay, any other clarifying questions about the, the people I just underlined? So, really quick, we have like five more minutes, which is perfect. Um, so, I want to talk, you know, now we've covered practice a little bit, right? We can gather practices from these characters and what the characters do. But where do those practices fall into society? What are the roles of these witches? So, we've talked about that with witch doctors and cunning folk quite a bit. They are accessible forms of health care. They're social mediators. They're um, priests, in a sense, as well. They're the mediums between the divine and things unknown. Um, and necromancers <coughs> are the pre-scientists. They're the explorers of the unknown in a very elite way. They're um, educated clergymen. Priests were also necromancers. You know. um, their role affected our society a lot, and clearly because of the top-down effect of early modern society changed and ended a lot of lives. Um, however, today, necromancers, do they have a role? <laughs> I think it's such a niche thing that it's, it's interesting. I guess the main role now is sort of a historical one. Right, so these necromancers are today are the people who are still reading those old books um, that you know these huge volumes that these guys wrote down um, and preserving these traditions in that sense. Potential malefic witches. What what would be some uses for someone who can kill people and hurt people? Yeah. That's really interesting if you guys go there. Yeah, exactly. So it's a way of hurting people without the accountability, right? There's no, like, well, there are still laws against witches. That's a different thing. But um, it's really hard to prove a curse in a court of law in America, at least. Um, not everywhere. And their witch hunts are, like, still a thing in a lot of places. Kenya. Um, parts of India, um, it's Uganda. It's like it's a huge fucking problem, and it's very sexist, um, and it, I would say even more so than the witch trials in a big way. Um, okay. But it's really interesting that you guys talked about these political things, right? Um, the contemporary witches in the sixties and seventies—that was like their huge kind of role, right? They were, it was, and this was partially a media stunt, but they were like cursing big political figures and, um, you know, protesting with, like, public rituals and spells and stuff. It's very interesting. And this is something that still happens. Um, there's a badass Icelandic witch, um, and if, come up to me if you want to, I can't remember her name, it's Icelandic. Um, but she had this, like, rally where she, in Iceland, in front of parliament, where she had everyone hold black flags and she read like ancient Icelandic incantations to a microphone as she threw rotten meat in front to like gather crows who, and then she like sent a bard at the establishment and like everyone that she cursed lost their job or got like really sick in the next couple of years. So she's <laughs> badass. Um, yeah, so politics have become, very, this is a very new thing, have become a huge part of witchcraft. Um, all right, and the role of contemporary witches? All right, it's kind of complicated. There's a lot of them. Um, I think history, clearly, is one of the roles. Um, but I think it's, it's contemporary witches are, it's such an umbrella term that you can find these other groupings within this time period. Because contemporary really is denoting the time period that is now. And so you can find these different kinds of witches still today. Um, so they hold lots of different roles, mostly arguing over Tumblr, but like, <laughs> there's, lots, there's lots of things. Um, OK, so that's, that's witchcraft. Um, there's further reading there on the board. If you guys want, um, you can ask me questions. And then I'm going to sit here and answer questions. So yeah.
Other you need to, you can leave if you need to. Other than a contemporary, which what would you describe yourself as of those categories? All right, um, out of those categories, I would say I'm kind of a mix, <laughs> like a lot of the figures I talked about. Um, you know, I would say more than anything, I kind of go for the cunning folk practices. Um, I'm, I study folklore and accessibility and um, sort of bottom-up traditions are really important to me, and I find them really beautiful. Um, and so that's how I try and base most of my practice, but I have a lot of necromantic texts on my computer. And, um, and I read those too, and um, definitely curse my fair show. Anyway. <laughs> I have uh, sort of two questions. One is one kind of question. That question is where do you, where do you see uh, technology fitting into and changing this world? Mm. That's a really big question. Um, I think the biggest aspect of it is probably the technological cultures, the internet cultures, are having a huge effect on um, paganism, which is a separate thing. Um, which I didn't really talk about. Witchcraft and religion are separate. There's like a witch kind of figure in every religion. So witchcraft, except for Wicca, is not a religion. Um, so there are Hindu witches, there are Christian witches, there are Buddhist witches, there are pagan witches, there are Nordic pagan witches, there are Greek pagan witches, there are lots of... It, witchcraft is a craft, a practice, that revolves around a religious structure, clearly it's spiritual. But anyway, sorry, I had to clarify that. I forgot. Um, so in the internet cultures, we see a lot of like a lot of misinformation gets circulated, so that's kind of frustrating. Um, but I think it's always been that way. I think it's just taken it's just moved to a new place and a much more accessible place. Um, so to say that the internet witchcraft culture is detrimental is like too black and white. It's complicated. Um, at the same time, like if I <laughs> straight up, if I like purchased every single book I have on my computer, I would not know this much. So that's another part of internet culture that we should all be honest about, is that you can find a lot of free PDFs. So I think more than anything, technology is promoting magic and um, witchcraft and making it more accessible to more people. Um, and it certainly makes it easier. I did not have to load an entire suitcase of books here, just half. But it's case of books to college. So, yeah. then the, the second question I had was where do you see the alchemists fitting into these worlds? Um, as I understand, it sort of seems transitional between the necromancer and the scientist. Absolutely. Absolutely. A necromancer is almost, it could almost be considered a, a type of alchemist. Um, so, alchemy in the late medieval and early modern and Renaissance periods is. A practice that was much less um, supernatural than all of this stuff. There was certainly a mystical and a supernatural and even a religious aspect to alchemy. Um, however, the predominant practices of alchemy were focused on what was considered tangible to almost everybody there. Um, the natural world, um, but then also like astrology, like I said, and theology plays into that because to them that was super tangible. But there were skeptics throughout all of history, right, who were saying, like, ghosts and Sabbaths, that's Donkey Kong. And um, they, so they were not witches. That's important. They were not always necromancers, although sometimes they were both. Um, but an alchemist is, uh, an awesome thing, um, someone just came out with a book about women and alchemy in the Renaissance, and um, I can get that for you if anyone's interested in it. But um, it's really cool. It's talking about like Caterina de Medici in Florence and like, oh god, it's <coughs> the bad. Anyway, okay. Um, so not necromancers, but a similar idea, right? Just with it looked a little bit different and had a little bit of a different role. Um, it was, I think, except for medicine, it was less tangible and more focused on um, the ideas and like the plants rather than what spirits the plants summon. Yeah? Um, of the cunning folk, um, that which one do you practice? Is it on a daily basis? And can you compare it to religion in a way that there are practices that you should do daily or on specific days or how does that 
That's a really good question. Uh, question. Um, so, no, it's okay. I love it. Um, so, I'm really eclectic. I, you know, in studying all of these things, I find lots of different practices and traditions and ideas that, like, I think work. You know, that I do, um, and I take them from lots of different places. Being as educated and aware and respectful as possible, which is really important. Um, you know, something that works for someone else, like. Okay, uh, sage burning, I'm going to bring that up again, like the idea of cleansing a space through sage. I'm not saying that doesn't work, but like if someone really believes in these spirits um, or gods and they want to cleanse a space, but like my gods are like mostly European gods, why would I be using a different culture's technique to cleanse the space when I could burn frankincense or juniper or copal or wash the floor or sweep the room from back to front and have the same effect? Um, so I do a lot of things. It's really mixed. Um, I, I don't. I didn't have like a teacher, right? So that's something that's weird. Um, I'm not working within just one tradition. I'm looking at a whole bunch of traditions and doing my best to make that functional. Um, and then, in terms of do I do anything daily? I would say the only thing I do daily is like. Every day is like think about this stuff, and um, it's kind of a part of my reality. It's not, you know, I think it's a very Western, new Western thing to separate the supernatural and the natural in daily life, um, and that's not something I've found works for me. I think that there are supernatural aspects to almost everything, um, and it's just like a part of my mentality. Um, so when like you know, a really basic example that makes me sound much less weird than the other examples is like when I'm picking out an outfit, I'm aware of like the magical connotations of that color or whatever, or the material itself, and like without even thinking that just plays into where I put it, how I wear it, stuff like that. Um, in terms of it being religious, my spirituality and my craft are separate but not completely separate things. Um, they're not mutually exclusive, um, but they definitely come together in some weird ways. Um, and they don't always match up. There's a lot of contradictions. Like, I'll believe in something when I'm, like, thinking about life and shit, like we all do at Sarah Lawrence, because existentialism is a thing. <laughs> and then when I go to practice, when I go to, like, help a patient, it's not always, I'm not thinking about those things as much as just doing what I know you do to do this thing. Um, so just like how we all continue to spend a lot of money and do all these things when we all know we'll die someday and it will all go to waste perhaps or we won't change anything perhaps like you just kind of do something to do it I don't know um, but I don't have I wouldn't say that there's a religious practice or a magical practice that I do every day it's just more on um, special or holy days that's not universal though a lot of cunning folk and um, which doctors do things like every day, and it's way more ingrained and present in their life. What role does Halloween play? Nice. Um, okay, so Halloween um, is a traditionally, it, or originally, it's an Irish holiday, and it's actually one of the only one of only four ancient Celtic holidays that we know about, um, opposed to popular belief. So um, originally, it was called Samhain. And spelled Samhain, but don't say that. And um, it was one of the nights when ghosts, witches, fairies, and demons would uh, come to the world of the living, and like fairies would raid castles, and witches would, you know, ride animals and cast curses, and uh, heroes would have epic battles. And this is the lore that was associated with Halloween. Partially because of that, um, the biggest aspect, the most relatable aspect, the thing that people held on to about that day outside of these epics and legends was um, the returning of the dead, right? So we have all of these traditions of protecting against and against dead spirits that you don't want in your house and welcoming spirits that you do want in your house back. Um, a couple examples are jack-o'-lanterns. Um, so originally those were actually turnips instead of pumpkins that people would carve and put candles in with like scary faces, probably to scare away evil spirits from the front door. Although we don't know because this wasn't written down, all of it. Um, and then uh, dumb suppers 
is um, when people are having their big Halloween dinner. This happens still today in some places. They'll usually like light a candle in the window or something to let their loved ones know that they can come back to this house. Um, and they'll leave an empty place at the table with food and a drink and um, sometimes even like a cigarette or a cigar. Um, this is all a type of ancestral worship. And um, so the idea then is that the dead person coming back through the veil on this special night feasts with the family once more. And um, then they're sent back on their way. Um, a lot of people traditionally would do types of divination on Halloween, um, mostly about lovers and marriage, at least in England. Um, that's what, in Ireland, that's what people would focus on, is um, you know, specific Halloween games and divinations that they took seriously, but also they were just for fun about finding out who you would marry and shit like that. How did you get into the Irish Alright, um, so when I was like, like as you, if any of you have me on Facebook, like my profile picture, you can tell that I've been <coughs> obsessed with witches since I was like a baby, but I didn't know that was like, that witchcraft was a thing, like a real, like, I can do that, um, until I was, you know, like 10 or 11, and then when I was 12, um, the mother of my best friend came to visit, and she was um, more along the lines of an alchemist, really. Um, she was a hermetic Gnostic, so it was a Christian-based tradition, a mystical kind of ascetic tradition, um, and she brought me into that and started teaching me about like history and um, spirituality and mysticism, and I kind of took that and ran with it in my own direction and found this stuff. Then, you know, reading hella, practicing hella, talking to a lot of old pities in my town um, at the witch shop, you know, it, picked up what I could, and now it's what I study at college, so. Do you think that any person is capable of becoming a witch or doing practices? That's a really good question. Um, all right, so this is how I usually describe it, is that just like with any art or tradition or um, talent, right, because we, you know, what we're really asking here is the capability of someone to practice witchcraft. Um, so, like, art is a good example. There are people who have a huge tradition of artists in their family, right? Everyone's been an artist, and their parents have taught them art since they were young, and now if you ask them to, like, draw a building, they can do it, like, just like their parents did, right? Um, and that's sort of this idea of, like, the tap, like, the tradition being passed on. Then there's people who are born and no one they know is an artist, but like there's drawing since like you know they can walk. They've just been like drawing, 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 and they're just obsessed with it. And it's this passion that drives it, and they teach themselves, or then they seek out teachers. And then there's people who try and try and try to draw and are just shit at it, and <laughs> they just can't, you know. So um, I think witchcraft is similar. Magic really is what is similar to that in the sense that I think to become a magician of any kind to become a witch, um, you need to either have an extreme passion for it, have a family that, gave, or like a, you know, a, the education for it, like in your culture, um, or you're just born with, you know, talents, and you either are blessed with the culture and the knowledge of how to deal with those talents, or you're not. Um, and then that becomes really difficult. Um, something that comes up with my role being like a public figure and a witch is that people will come to me with their stories. And everyone has stories, right? Everyone has the creepy thing they saw in their bedroom that they still don't know how to explain and they don't think about it. Everyone has, uh, not every, a lot of people have dreams that about things that <laughs> haven't happened yet and then they happen and they're like, what? and they don't know how to deal with that. Um, some people like, you know, fuck around and they like stick a pin in a picture of some guy and they're like, I hope you break your legs. And the next day he's like, where is he? <laughs> oh, he broke his legs yesterday. <laughs> 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 you know. So that was actually a lady I met in Italy that happened. Um, so I think the supernatural is a part of everyone's life in some way. And if you haven't had something like this happen to you, you do know someone 
um, who this has happened to because it's actually so many people. But the people, there's no avenue in our culture today to talk about these things. So for people who have the natural talent for it rather than the passion or the education, um, it can be something really difficult to deal with because um, you know, you're like in class or you're, you say you're on a date, right? You're having a nice dinner and then you're like, you're really into this person and you're nervous and you look up and there's like a dead girl staring at you from behind him and you're like, what the fuck? It's terrifying. Um, and that's a part of your everyday life. If you don't have the tools to deal with that, it's really difficult. And I know a lot, um, really almost completely girls, at least um, people who identify as women coming up to me and talking to me about this, although I'm sure it's not really a gender-based thing, but it's interesting looking at the gender ideas within these that that's the majority of people who come up to me. There's a lot of people who come up to me and they've never talked about this stuff and they're like terrified and they don't know how to keep going because they don't know how to control this shit. So that's one of the bigger roles of contemporary witchcraft I think today is providing some sort of outlet for these beliefs and these ideas and these fears. Um, whether you believe in them or not, right? So this is either literally these things are happening and this is who you can go to to solve them, or like people, or anthropologically, right, we're treating people as subjects. Um, this is like something that someone believes is happening and they have no outlet for that fear so they can go to this person and resolve it. So yeah, I think passion, uh, tradition, um, and talent. What do you see witchcraft and like as a career for you? Are you do you want to go into witchcraft as like a career like open up a witch doctor shop or whatever or I thought about that for a long time actually and I decided that I don't want this to be something I make money off of I, or rather no I'm going to take it it's not something that I want to make a living off of um, I mean it's a service it costs money to like get materials to do rituals and spells and stuff um, and it takes that blackload of time, so like, yeah, I want some reimbursement when I do uh, something for a patient. Um, but you know, like, it doesn't have to be money, whatever, bartering, like, I work with people. But I think I came to a place where I realized that if this, if like living and my own monetary success and survival is the focus of my witchcraft, I will no longer be really communicating with spirits or really trying to just help people. Um, or hurt people, which is sort of the point. Um, and in that, I would lose the focus, and that's not something I want. So, um, teaching, uh, literally teaching how to do it, and also teaching about it, like I'm doing, um, studying, um, these are all things that I want, like, I would be willing to make those part of my livelihood. Um, and I think I'll usually, right now I'm not taking patients because I, like, need some me time, but like usually I'll just take patients and um, you know I make a little bit of spare change off of that. But some witches will charge like like 300 bucks for a spell or something. I charge like 30 dollars usually on top of like the supply fees. <laughs> yeah, so it's not about the money. It's just about the things. So, yeah. You got. Um, most of the time when people come to me asking for a spell or a potion or a ritual, they're really, uh, the main thing is like love problems, um, which I'm always really wary of. I think the most common thing is people wanting love spells to make someone fall in love with them, but it's often, uh, went through this huge phase where the only thing people were asking for is breakup spells. I'm just like, get over them, fuck. Um, it's just not the avenue you need to take, find the therapist. Um, but then other things related to love, bringing old lovers back, that's the most common thing. Um, then quickly after that I would say is money and financial stability is something that people look for and I help people as much as I can with that. And then um, sort of protection stuff, the fear or the actuality of being magically or uh, spiritually attacked in some way. Um, and you know, me providing resources to protect them from that, um, which is, the actuality of that is pretty rare, um, but like, shit happens, as I've already said, we, there's clear examples of people actually cursing people, so like, hopefully that has an effect, or what the fuck am I doing with my life, <laughs> right? What's the moral stone of the crystal? Anyone? 
Interesting. Um, so stones and crystals have played a very minor role, I would say, in most types of witchcraft throughout history and magic. I would, I would say like alchemy is really the place where they've had the most uh, use and uh, pharmacy. Um, and even today, that is kind of the majority of the role is like healing crystals, right? It's all about using stones and um, minerals to uh, affect health in a positive way. Um, and which can include mental health. However, it's really become a thing like since the 60s and 70s. Um, and I think that is kind of a guess. I think it mostly comes from the hippie movement and appropriations of Eastern culture and philosophy, uh, which is a huge part of that. Um, and so, you know, if we're looking at like old wise women in England, um, a lot of the times they would give out these little charm bags to protect against witches or to heal people. Um, and in those, sometimes you would find a stone, um, like this one, with like a natural hole in it. Um, it's called an adder stone. You would also find things like uh, amethyst or quartz, really just basic common crystals, sometimes like a sapphire, there's a fancy thing. Um, and this is because in elite necromancy, like these stones all did have properties. And like I said, it was sort of a trickle-down effect um, from necromancers and then also a trickle-up effect from um, witch doctors and cunning folk into elite magic down to folk magic. Um, and so crystals play a part in witchcraft, but like not the amount that people talk about today. I have like, I have like two crystals, <laughs> and I just use them for protection and stuff. Anyone else? Uh, you mentioned earlier something about true traditional witches. And I'm kind of curious, have you met any true traditional witches? Mm, so people who are like cunning folk or evil yeah. witches living in the countryside. Um, true traditional witches in that sense? Kind of. Kind of, but like, not enough. <laughs> no, I'm going to say no, I haven't. Um, you know, I've talked to people, I've talked to a lot of people who've known them and have read a lot about them and their biographies and stuff like that, but they're really hard to find, especially in America. The only place I think you could find them in America today, um, really like witches, not Buddha priests, not someone who's commercial, um, would be like the Appalachian Mountains. And even that's like, you're really fucking lucky if you can find one. So they're just not really a thing here anymore. Um, and also, like in Italy, where I was, I was kind of looking and looking, but there's, it's all just become kind of a part of capitalism, and then if you're lucky. I mean, they, they do exist. I've watched interviews of them. They're around. Um, but they're rarer and rarer because, like all folk traditions, like folk music, like folk art, it's not something that the modern world has space for, um, which is sort of the role of folklorists and witches today, I think, is to preserve it in some capacity. Um, so they start to disappear because young people don't want to keep the traditions alive anymore. They don't have the memory for it even because some of these things are oral traditions that are super long and now that everything's written in our society we literally don't have the mental capacity anymore to memorize these old epics and tales that hold the knowledge about magic and witchcraft and the gods and the spirits and stuff. So it's interesting. But no. Um, you mentioned the connection between like anti-Semitism and like Savannah witches. How do you think that like has trickled down into like contemporary witchcraft? Ooh, damn, good question. Um, I would say that contemporary witchcraft, in that I've already talked about it being a huge media thing and really a capitalist uh, institution of you know witches and neo wiccans and things like that, has marketed itself very much as like an all-accepting, all-encompassing um, path, like religious alternative to the main like dogmatic, you know, hateful religions, even though, you know, as I've already talked about, there's a lot of appropriation and hate and bullshit in the contemporary witchcraft community as well. Um, I would say that most people who practice witchcraft have lost the association that witchcraft has with anti-Semitism and um, other forms of racism and bigotry, at least to their knowledge, right? So like, 
even though we're still saying Sabbath and then talking about the witch's Sabbath. It's like, or Shabbat and the witch's Sabbath. It's like, no, people don't get that connection unless like they read about it or someone tells them about it. Um, but we're still using those words and words carry a history and a presence and an idea with them. So I'm not gonna say that it's completely out of there, but I don't think people are aware of it. Does okay. that answer your question? Yeah. Like you said stuff about like, oh, I think like things like they would talk about which is like eating babies and stuff, and I was like, oh, that's a thing that Jewish people <laughs> they, did. Exactly. That's something they said Jewish people did, heretics did. It's part of the process of scapegoating. Yeah. There were people werewolves as well. It's the idea of taking <laughs> goodness and <clears throat> flipping it on its head. Right. And the most human way you can do that is like abundant sex and baby killing. So you always see like orgies and, and boiling babies and stuff like that and all of these things. Yeah, so that's interesting. And then to see how that fear works itself into actual witchcraft traditions is interesting because um, the witch as a scapegoat has accepted that role. It's become, it's inherently an outsider, right? If everyone was walking around worrying about all this shit all the time, no one would get anything done. Like, you have to have someone who's designated to take care of this supernatural craziness. And um, so witchcraft, witches have always been, no matter the definition, have always been somewhat on the outskirts of society. Um, and they sort of take what's thrown at them. It's a, it's a culture, it's a tradition, it's reactive. And so, just like curses and evil doing become a part of traditions with potential malefic witches, in with that is a creepy fucking ingredients in those potions like baby that and stuff. Anyone else? Yeah? Uh, just, uh, so, you mentioned Rome having a higher rate of uh, killing off witches than anything else. What were Roman witches, like, what did they look like compared to kind of these more modern day examples, I guess? Exactly. In ancient Rome and ancient Greece and ancient Egypt, we can find trial documents as well, like legal documentation, and we can also find these epics and these tales, right? So it's still storytelling and then, like, uh, annals, records. And um, through those, we can piece together some stuff. We also have ancient uh, manuscripts for spells and rituals and stuff. So in ancient Rome, the traditions were very religious-based. Almost all magic went through some sort of communication. It was based on communication and sympathetic ritual, meaning that um, a, you know a spell would involve like a petition and an offering to a deity, but also like uh, a representation of what was supposed to happen, like sticking a doll with some needles or a clay figure with some needles um, to the points of the body that you want afflicted, right? So this is something happening on a small scale that affects a change on a larger scale. Um, also, just side note, that has nothing to do with voodoo or voodoo. Voodoo doll is like a super racist term, actually. Um, that's a completely uh, Roman-based European tradition. Um, completely. Completely. No, there are no voodoo dolls. That's it's not voodoo dolls. They're puppets. Or um, anyway. so in Roman society, you had people who were just like in the Roman Catholic Church, right? Not much changed when Rome fell in terms of that. Um, there are people designated with orthodox tools and official methods and rituals to deal with supernatural things, um, whether those be prayers, petitions, or curses. Um, and there was a system in place. There were uh, usually like traveling magicians who had these like sorcerous texts, usually just like one or two, hard to get a hold of, um, who would travel around and again for a high price would perform um, magical rituals um, that was more accessible than the Roman Orthodox rituals, but also um, they would do things that were taboo. Then you have and so that was, that's magic, right? You have religion, you have magic, and um, so you, you guys kind of know about Roman cults and stuff? So there's like the official Roman religion, and then there's little, which is divided into little cults. Some of these cults were like, I with the Roman emperor, imperial power. Others were like really outcasted and, and hated, um, even targeted. 
And like uh, Dionysian cult with the main ads, it would get super drunk and rip through animals and beasts and men and stuff. That doesn't really fit into like a Roman power structure. Um, so it was a problem that had to be dealt with. Um, which is, so, that, so there's, you know, some of these cults are performing mystical feats and like, I would say they're more miracles than magic. And then there's these magicians doing magic. And then there's the official people doing religion. And then there's these figures in the myths, and we don't have enough documentation. We barely have enough documentation from a couple hundred years ago to say that there were like, you know, like hags who were, you know, flying around and like doing crazy things um, and like dark magic kind of stuff. Um, so like working with the dead is something that magicians did a lot. That was super taboo in Rome. Um, so if you were so you could get in really big legal trouble for doing those kinds of things. Um, however, you would be killed for witchcraft, which is um, related. The idea of the witch, um, which we can find in these legends and stuff, comes from the Roman ideas, again, of winter, death, ninth time. Um, the Roman word for a witch, the Latin word for a witch, is strix, which means screech owl. So you see the parallel with the nighttime there as well. And they, um, you would be charged with like witchcraft, with doing this like nocturnal death winter magic um, when there were crops failing, when someone died, when bad things were happening. Even in Rome, it was a form of scapegoat. Um, not to say that these traditions weren't a thing, because we don't know. Um, but yeah, so there was legal repercussions for doing unorthodox magic. And then there were like executions for doing unorthodox magic and then causing harm. So magic is already taboo, but then the consequences of doing magic are based on a spectrum of how much harm was done. It's pretty different. Um, yeah. Do you have any theories on why witches traditionally tend to be portrayed as evil? I think it plays into this, honestly, I think it plays into this idea of uh, winter, nighttime, death, and evil. And um, unfortunately, in Western society, that's off, those have often been uh, archetypes associated with women. Um, the left side of the body versus the right side of the body in like medieval alchemy is like the feminine versus the masculine, and the evil versus the good. Um, hell versus heaven. So it's all interrelated. The idea that women bring, I mean, you know, this is all very like philosophical and we can't ground it in a lot, but their ideas. Um, the idea that a woman can give life, but then can also take it away. The idea that some of the older figures in ancient, like Nordic religions and Celtic religions, and um, even like pre-Greek religions, pre-Etruscan religion, um, the rulers of the underworld and hell were often women. So that might play into it as well. We don't know. Could it also potentially relate to, to user learning and sexuality? Yes. Well, okay. So here's the thing is where this, where the idea that women actually have these powers comes from is one thing, which I've just talked about. Where the idea that why women were 75% of the thousands of people murdered for witchcraft in the early modern period relates to misogyny. And... So the idea that this is, I mean, people have lots of ideas about this, right? Not everyone agrees. My idea, and I'm pretty confident about it, is that, you know, so if you're a sabbatic or a phosphate witch, you're inverting your role in society, right? Um, for, to be like a woman and ergo a human and like have emotions, etc., you're by nature going against what that society says you're allowed to do. Right? You can't be angry in a woman in early modern society. You can't be loud. You can't be vulgar. You can't be rude. You can't be sexual. Um, there is one case where a girl was running across a field, and she hiked up her skirt to run better, and she got hung as a witch because she exposed her genitalia. She was like a little girl. So this is an example of how doing natural things as a human, but being a woman, which is not seen as human in the society, inverts your role. So we get a lot of people who are angry at their neighbors, and there's a neighbor dispute, and one of the parties is a woman, and because she's arguing, et cetera, they're like, ah, you're a witch. Where were the um, flip-flopping of roles in a society be then related to men, a man witch? 
Interesting. Um, if we're looking at a woman who's dominant and loud and um, stands up for herself, where what are we looking in a man? Awesome. So there, you know, a male witch, which we have, you know, a, a barely substantial documentation of. They were like still inverting all of these other aspects of being a human besides gender roles, right? Mm -hmm. So they're still worshiping the devil, they're still hurting people with magic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, however, we don't find that much gender inversion, or at least not much focus on it, because it's not really a concept that people had consciously. However, um, like I kind of hinted at, witches at the Sabbath would have sex with the devil, um, and male witches were included. So, is that sort of like a homophobia sort of? I would say it plays into the ideas, although again, the idea of homosexuality from that time period to where we are today is very different. Um, looking at like parts of early modern Europe, like one town to the next, the idea of like what's acceptable masculinity was very different. So it's hard to put an overarching thing on it. But I think there's definitely something to the idea of a male witch becoming submissive to the devil, having this lordly master. Mm -hmm. um, and who then fucks them in the butt is like something that was taboo, I would say, yeah. Anyone else? That's kind of a weird place to end this, but. <laughs> <laughs> no? Alright. If you guys have more questions, like, you know where I live, so. Thank you guys for coming.